Welcome back to Goldmark TV. Now you might have seen that we've got a, a very exciting uh, live chat with uh, Potter Anameta Yotsoi tomorrow. Uh, Mike Goldmark's going to be talking with Anameta, who's uh, live from Bornholm, uh, the little island that she works from uh, off the coast of Denmark. She's going to be talking through some of the, um, of the recent work that she's been doing, um, what it's like uh, working in lockdown on, uh, uh, on uh, the island of Bornholm, and uh, uh, delving into some of the, the influences and the, the philosophies behind her work. Today we thought we would uh, show you a, a screening of the film that we shot of Animator back in 2012, um, just to sort of get your taste buds uh, wetted for, for tomorrow. Um, if you've got any questions for Animetta, anything that you'd like to ask her about her work, uh, about the, her influences, her inspiration, um, the things that she's got planned, uh, new things that she's taking on, do please email us, uh, message us on social media. Uh, we'd love to know what you'd like to hear from her uh, and we'll try and get some of those messages across to her uh, when we go live tomorrow. Uh, for now, I'm going to leave you in uh, Animetta's very capable hands. My name is Annemette Jortshoi and I'm a potter here on this fairly small Danish island called Bornholm. It's uh, been a potter's island since the 17th century actually, so there's always been many people uh, working with clay. I grew up in the countryside on a farm. And, you know, when you're a child, you, you, I never thought about living, grow, growing up in the countryside. That was just what I did. Um, but I don't belong in a big city. But I moved here because I became a student in what was then the Glass and Ceramic School on Bornholm. I was actually part of the very first group of students here. So we were a group of spoiled young people just working with clay. We had a few books in the school. We didn't, the library was very small this first year. Uh, and there was actually, there was this book on ash glazes. Um, and I, I'd just been flicking around in the book and look, looking at the pictures. Um, and I thought, wow, this is really beautiful. Um, so John Gibson, head of the ceramic department in the school, he knew Phil and he rang him up and asked him whether he would like to have a student. I didn't know how fortunate I was at that time. There is plenty to do working for a potter, mixing clay, mixing glazes, cleaning the workshop every now and then cleaning pots after firing. I had the best time in my life. And I learned a lot. He is an extremely good teacher. Mr. Rogers, yeah. And also later, um, after I graduated and I came back to, to live here on Bornholm, I started um, digging down into the history of Bornholm ceramics, which then becomes the history of Danish ceramics. We have three schools. The group of Danish potters, where Gude Eriksen was a teacher, that graduated from the academy in Aarhus. And then there is the school in Copenhagen. The Royal Porcelain Factory in Copenhagen always had ceramic artists working there in the factory, which has played a big role to Danish ceramics. And then there is the Potters on Bornholm that has got their roots in the Yard factory. And one important woman, her name is Gertrude Vesegård, she has made a big influence on Danish ceramics. Actually, she's said to be um, you know, the roots 
of what we're all working on now. When I worked in Wales, Phil asked me if I wanted to do a lecture on Danish contemporary ceramics. I didn't know many Danish potters at that time. So it gave me a possibility to ring up people and ask, could I borrow pictures of your work? So I had a chance to, to meet Danish potters. I also phoned um, Gude Eriksen. She worked with Bernard Leach. And it's, it's so funny when I, when I called her. You know, at this, I'm an animator and I'm living here in Bornholm and I'm doing this lecture. And she sent me a whole box full of material, catalogues and, and interviews she did in America at some point. And she, we spent half an hour on the phone. Um, she, she, you know, I got a little embarrassed because she said, but uh, where do you use, where do you, where do you go and dig the clay? Do you know the clay here? And the clay is, is very good at this point on Bornholm. And, but, but are you not using it? And you, she just, she just, she was all into the process, you know, when I said Bornholm. Um, she, she has come here to dig a lot of clay. And actually there's a farmer who's got a private beach with lots of good clay. And he's got quite a collection of her work uh, because they, you know, they've swapped. I go and dig clay for my glazes and my slips and that where I use the local clay from the beach, the beautiful red clay. I could just use iron oxide, but I think it's a good excuse to get out of my workshop. So I use this clay not for making, but I use it in glazes. Um, it's a beautiful red terracotta clay. It doesn't fire to a very, very high temperature. But it, 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 I use it in the S glazes. It, it gives a very nice color, you know, from the iron, of course. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting with this clay, actually, because you got this amazing green color here. And then you have this red clay. It's all from the same ore. But as I understand, then uh, the red clay is underneath the green clay, if you look up here. And it's simply because the red clay, you know, this has been here millions of years. And during the time there's been running water through the lower part of the clay, which has oxidized it. So it's the same clay, it's just, you know, like uh, you know, when iron rusts, it, it, it goes red. But, so you don't get this color when it's fire. Sadly enough, because it's so beautiful, the green color. For me, it takes time to get to know clay, surfaces, shapes, and it's a, it's a lot about seeing, I think. Some things don't catch your interest, but then something does. You just get deeper and deeper into it, you know, all of a sudden you see it. When I sit here making these cylinders, you know, it's just a cylinder, but it's, it's an oval dish, and I can spend the whole day, it's my favorite, sitting here and just making bowls, lots of bowls, or lots of little oval cylinders, lots of cups, and just play around with the um, proportions. You know, 300 grams of clay, just a little lump of clay, and you make lots of little cylinders. And then when they are leather hard, I shape them, and it changes the whole thing so much, you know, just the way that you have played around with the portions, you know, if you put the line just a little tiny bit like more like this or like this, or it just changes the whole shape. And that, that's interesting. And when you make a handle or you make a foot room, um, it's, a, it's all the little details. And then 
that combining with the way you fire. It's, it's to put all the chapters into, into a story. If, if you read a really interesting book, or an exciting book, or a, you, know, you, you just can't leave it again till, till you finish, and it, it, it never finishes. And the same, I think, it is for me when I look at a bowl or a cup or a cylinder or something for use. It just, it just, it just stays there, and you can, you know, you keep reading the book again and again, and you find something new in it. So it's the same with pots, I think. It's a very good thing to have your workshop at home because you have to do things when the clay has got the right consistency. So you just have to always you know, take good care of the clay. It's like your grandmother, you can't leave her alone. She needs care all the time. Little old cylinder. For me, I think it's it's a little bit about beauty. Um, I like beautiful things. I I need to be surrounded by beautiful things, and beauty, of course, is you know it it it's different from each person. And it's not that I say I make beautiful things, but I, I try the best I can. You know, it's just mud. It's just clay. And um, fire and quartz and ash, wood ash, and, and very basic materials. But it's very fascinating that from those basic materials, that you can create beautiful work, beautiful pots for use. I make my own stamps. I just have a lump of clay and then I carve out uh, patterns. I stamp the surface when the piece is still quite wet, but it needs to be hard enough for this stamp not to stick. I think I, I quite like the repetition. It kind of does something interesting. It picks up the salt in the firing, so it kind of emphasizes the decoration, and I like that. It's kind of one story. I, I just do the same thing with the porcelain bowls. They've got a glaze on, so it's a different story, but it's kind of the same where the glaze run into the little pool here. It goes a dark green, and when there's like a little top, the porcelain comes through. I like quiet pots, I think. Making quiet pots, because there's going to be food in here, and that's going to take a lot of attention, hopefully. Being a woman wood fire, yeah, at least for me, it, uh, I don't do it on my own. Um, I've shared workshop with another woman, uh, a Swedish uh, ceramic artist called Ancelot Olsen, and we always fire together. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't um, be a wood fire uh, if I was going to do all this work on my own. If you get good reduction, you get beautiful, beautiful colors. But if you have too much reduction, or if you don't clean the atmosphere, you can get nasty surfaces. Fire needs oxygen burning. 
And if we can't take the oxygen from the air because we put too much firewood in there, then fire takes oxygen from the clay. And that changes the color. So you want to look into the kiln to check the, the reduction. But as soon as you open just a little bit, you get air inside. So you also look at these little holes we drilled in the arts. You know, if the little flames coming out, it means it's a pressure. It's good. But you need to, you know, we need to burn down the wood to get clean atmosphere. And then the temperature rises and then we stoke again. So we have to find the rhythm. In a salt kiln, if you don't have good reduction, you have base, and we don't like base. So if you get good reduction, you have chestnut, reddish, brown. Sometimes you get little mother of pearlish surfaces, and that, that's beautiful. But it's difficult. Okay, Ancelot, nu tror jeg, at vi skal første kammer. So we're going to stoke in this one now. With salt glazing, decoration happens in the kiln. This bowl is stoneware clay and it has just got a kaolin slip. I've just brushed that on and then it's placed in the kiln with another bowl inside. And then I stack this one inside the other bowl. Um, and there's another one stacked on top of that, and then it goes into the kiln. So where a lot of flame comes, and with the fire, I put salt in and put it in the kiln when I reach high temperature, and the salt vaporizes, and the natrium combines with the silicium from the clay, and it turns into a glaze. Um, but where in the bottom of this bowl, you know, it's been hidden away, it's not much flame or salt can get into this part that's protected from the other bowl. So it's a little drier and also it's got another color. So decoration happens in the firing. That's very interesting because you've got a colleague then and it's a big challenge because you have to learn from that and try to do the best you can to get beauty from what the kiln can offer you. Um, and that's also a big responsibility because you use a lot of firewood and you use a lot of clay and when you turn clay into ceramics you know you can't go back again and we've got enough things in this world um, so of course you have to think really carefully when you put something into the kiln in Danish you would say at Maskegosa Ume so you need to how would you translate that you need to pay honest attention uh, to what you're doing in life. It, it sounds a little deep, but you, you know, to drink a glass of rye, red wine also in between. But um, I think actually it is like that. And it's difficult. It's very difficult. And I'm not struggling because it's difficult, but I'm trying to do the best I can. And many times it's not good enough because it's so annoying if you have a really good piece coming out from the kiln and it's a bad shape, then it's my fault. Um, and you can't always control where you get the beautiful surfaces on which part. So you just have to pay attention to what you put in the kiln. I think I also came back to live on Bornholm because there's a beautiful nature here. I don't think about it when I make work that I'm inspired by nature. I don't think about that 
literally. Um, but of course I do. Sometimes I, you know, I do look out the window or I'm standing looking at a beautiful tree. Sometimes it's the reverse, then uh, peace comes from the firing and you know, it's, it's exactly the same colors um, than, you know, when, when it's winter and when it's just about to be sunset and there's a white, thick snow with a little bit of mud coming up through the snow and then you have the blue sky and then you have this pinkish orange starting, you know, in the horizon. And then you say, whoa, that's strange because that's just what's on the piece. So, you know, I, it, it doesn't always just go one way. It, it's, it's, it's nature, isn't it? So they just sometimes meet in funny ways. I know I'm fortunate to find a way in life where I, you know, life goes too fast. Time goes too fast. Um, time goes too fast. And on the other hand, when you're working with clay, it's a slow life because you can't force anything. Ceramic pots take time. But it's, it is an, it's an ongoing learning experience. Um, and it's, it's enough for me. It's a challenge, but it's a great challenge. So, so hi everybody. I hope it's not too bad where you are. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing you all on Monday. Take care. Uh, uh, educate, entertain our customers. Okay, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. We're thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. It was nothing forced. And I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery. Mm -hmm.